All right. Hello and welcome back. This is Colin Keeley here. And I'm Brent Sanders. And we are two guys buying and building wonderful internet companies. Yes, indeed. And, and Colin, you've been doing some homework, it sounds like. Yeah. So I take a lot of notes personally in the way different people operate. And so Robert F. Smith, Vista Equity Partners is a well-known one. He's the well, wealthiest African-American, wealthiest black guy. And he is famous for the quote, software companies taste like chicken. They're selling different products, but 80% of what they do is pretty much the same. I'm coming around to that, actually. I know I was very negative about that at first, but the more I think about it, the more I think he's right. Especially uh, yeah. as we've been looking at different deals and as they get bigger, you're like, all right, there, there's data in a database. There's a UI to put the data there and there's functions happening on that data. It's okay. It either runs or it doesn't. And as you get bigger and bigger, it matters less and less. That's not the reason you're going to do or not do a deal generally. It's like buying a car you know, and being like really worried, a vintage car, and you're like really worried about the engine versus buying a fleet of cars. You're not going to be worried about the engines anymore. It's just whatever. They run. You can hire mechanics to fix them, oil it up. Whatever you got to do, you do. It's a known quantity. And then, so Robert, he and Vista, they focus, uh, all the recent ones are like the last 10 years, I think are like all multi-billion dollar companies they're purchasing. Yeah. They're not that concerned about the engines at the scale. I guess before we dive in, like where have you been able to find the information on, on somebody like this? What are your sources? So I read everything I can. A lot of these guys are pretty secretive. So there's only generally a few articles. So I read all the articles. I send them to Instapaper, I highlight and all that gets sent into Rome. And then pretty recently, Robert was on a podcast, which is super cool because none of these guys ever go on podcasts, except for Chamath or something. So yeah, listen to that and just taking diligent notes and then compiling it all together. I ran it by a few people that have worked for Vista Equity Companies in the past, but I'd say almost all this stuff was publicly available knowledge. It's not like you're getting some secretive scoop from the inside. It's, this is stuff that's out there that you're aggregating. Effectively, yeah. So I do this just for myself and put it all into Rome. And so I would say I'm a really quick writer and a really slow editor. So it just takes me forever to clean up my messy words and make it appropriate for public consumption. That's a really good combination though, because I have the opposite and I never get started or I never finish a first draft. So it's, ugh, forget it. That's why I podcast because I, I prefer to talk to them. It's definitely but faster. I, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely faster, but you say it's a little bit harder to edit anyways. Before we jump in one other question, why him? Why Vista? Why Robert Smith? So I stumbled into this industry through Andrew Wilkinson and Tiny, and he is very much uh, management by abdication. And so through Andrew, I heard about Mark Leonard in Constellation Software, who's very similar management by abdication, like a super decentralized organism effectively. Robert Smith is the opposite. So those guys are buying kind of small, sleepier companies that are really good companies, but not going to be explosive growth. And Vista Equity focuses on uh, one of the only people to actually focus on these big, high growth tech companies. And they're super, super involved. So they're known mm. for their 110 point playbook. So they go deep into the companies and they basically assembly line style, improve them make them more profitable and then flip them generally, not always flipping them, but generally flipping them for a good amount more money. Interesting. So let's dig in. I assume Robert Smith before, before Vista, there's a background usually, and I don't know if he's has as storied and as diverse as a, a past as Mark Leonard, but what was his background? What got him into this sort of software private equity space? Yeah. So growing up, a uh, son of two PhDs who became Denver school principals, very into education. He went to Cornell to study chemical engineering. From all accounts, a very good student. He got an internship at Bell Labs. So he went there and then he, what did he do? He had some engineering jobs, Goodyear Tire, Kraft General Foods, where he was working on coffee machine technology. He mm -hmm. actually got two patents, one for a stainless steel filter another for a brewing process to make a uh, crema, which is like the layer of foam on top of an espresso. And then from there, he decided to go to business school. So he went to Columbia business school and he learned that while inventing things was a great way of life, capital and utilization of capital can actually be much more effective. Hmm. So after business school, he got into Goldman Sachs in the mergers and acquisitions, moved out to San Francisco, advised companies like Microsoft and eBay. The most interesting thing during this time was he was part of the team that helped recruit Steve Jobs back to Apple. Ooh, that's a pivotal moment, obviously, for Apple. If you remember, I lived through it when that was going on, the major change that 
basically birthed Apple to what it is now. And that must have been a very interesting, I'd love to, to have sat in the room that those conversations were going on. Because as we all know, Jobs burned more than a few bridges. And, oh, and for perspective, he's 58 years old. And so he ended up starting Vista around 2000. I guess the next question would be, you know, is that Goldman? Things are going well. They're heading towards an IPO. Like, why didn't he stay at Goldman? So while he was there, he's working with a lot of software companies. And he found this one Houston auto dealership software maker called Universal Computer Systems. And it's margins were way better than every other software company that he'd seen. And he figured out that it was because they had these like standard operating procedures. And that company was wildly profitable and they were just plowing all their money into CDs. So these certificate of deposits that return like nothing basically. And so he persuaded the founder of this auto dealership software maker, Robert Brockman to buy other software companies. And so he Brockman's, I don't really want to do it. I'll back you. I'll commit a billion dollars in two different phases if wow. you run this for me. And he went back and forth. He's old and going to IPO. I'm going to make a bunch of money. I'd never forgive myself if I didn't pursue this. So he stole some of his coworkers, some business school classmates and went and did it. Wow. And going back to this, and so this is probably what year, 1990 something, or is, is this in 2000? In 2000 is when they committed the money to them. Wow. It just reminds me, and, and I think the timing lines up pretty closely of these old sleepy software makers of like office space in a tech and there's a, just a room full, full of developers and then there's a room full of salespeople and just that era of, of what software was in like the late 90s and early 2000s, especially in Houston. So he quit a pretty sweet job and you have to think the timing is right, I would assume right around the, the crash. What was the first dot-com bust was late nineties, early two thousands. I'm, I'm not remembering, but I'm just trying to understand what was the, the climate around software at the time. People were gun shy around these like dot-com companies, but that wasn't what this software was. This was unsexy car dealership software, right? Yeah. So back then software was still pretty new and no one really appreciated it as like an asset class or like something to really focus on and invest in. People were really pumped about semiconductors and like tech service. There was really, it seemed like a lack of awareness around software and like why it is attractive. And there was a thinking that like, there's no way you could do leverage buyouts. So leverage buyouts, you have to get good debt. And you put up a little bit of equity to buy out these big companies, which is popular in like the eighties and nineties, but no one had ever really applied it to software. And everyone's like, why are you trying to do this? There's zero chance you're ever going to get any debt to do this. So it's just, mm. it's going to be a bad business. Don't leave Goldman. We're going to IPO soon. You're going to make a bunch of money. That's brilliant. And I remember from, I've already read your, your article, but in, in classifying this as an asset class, right? Like these software, these monthly or annual software fees. I think, what does it say that it's better than first lean debt, right? This is people will pay for their software first and then go on to kind of other debts. So it's mission critical software. It's stuff that the business runs on and it cannot run without it. It's manufacturing, not paying the lease on their machines, but better yet, you can't just come and grab the machines, but you, it's very easy to turn the software off. So the threat of and, and not that we're going down that route where people are getting their software turned off, but we were just talking about Slack being expensive. If you don't pay your bill, it just, it goes back to the free mode, which, you know, is missing all those features you want or need. And if you're relying on that, guess what? You're paying Slack every month. Yeah. And this is like the big discovery recently with Pipe. There's a bunch of people that want to invest into these software contracts and you don't have to do an equity. You can just do it in debt. And these software companies can finance all their growth without going out and raising more venture capital or something like that. Got it. Got it. And, and just for all the listeners, debts, talking about debt to the non-MBAs, that means going out to a bank and almost like thinking like a mortgage for a business. You're going to go out and say, hey, I have this money coming in all the time. It's worth this. It's not going anywhere. It's stable. Will you let me loan money again? Just for simple math, you could get $100,000 in debt, 6% interest rate. So you get $100,000 up front, and then you have to pay the bank like $6,000 every year. So Just how leverage killer. buyouts work is you like, you get all that loans and then you buy a company and then you use the business to pay off the loans. And like back in the eighties, it was like, 
crazy amount of debt, very little equity, and then you just cut costs. And even if the companies were flat, they would be significantly more profitable and they would have enough money to pay off the debt at least. And then if they increased it all in value, it's just uh, enormously magnified by the debt. And you could have crazy returns with like, you know, minimal improvements to the business. So Vista comes in and different from Constellation or Mark Leonard is it sounds like they want to get get in the nitty gritty, put in their own people, run their own playbook around this. And, and they have a pretty substantial playbook, which I assume comes from the engineering background, but also maybe some of the Goldman experience. You know, how, how is this shown to, to play out? Because if, if you're highly leveraged, right? If you're, in your words, let's say you use this $100,000 analogy, you're paying, you got to pay $6,000 a year to service this. And if the company's flat, all you got to do is find 6% of savings and you have a free company over overly simplified, of course. Right. Over a period of time. Yes. Yeah. What's their playbook like? Uh, So this is what they're known for. It's gone by different names. Vista standard operating procedures or Vista best practices, I think is what it's called now, or they often been called 110 point. So it's a closely guarded secret, but I, my understanding is it's actually just like traditional best practices and they just go down the list of these different three to 10 page documents with tons of uh, attachments and examples. And they're just like, so how is sales compensation calculated? No, that's not the right way to do it. This is the right way to do it. And here's like (laughs) a million examples to do it. And this is how we upsell products. And it's all, I don't know if in MBA driven companies, this is what would be there, but these are software companies with their funky founders and like legacy issues in the startup culture. So it's just missing best practices. And so they are known for paying high prices for businesses, but they're very confident that they can increase the value in them. So they Mm. buy things that are like $20 billion. Like you'd assume they'd be pretty well run, but they put these best practices in place and they seem to be able to turn them around and make good money on everyone. They've never lost money on a deal, which is pretty unique because they've done 500 plus. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. At that scale, I just don't really know what you're going to have in a playbook that isn't known. I guess maybe it's just, Hey, you have at that scale, maybe there there are factions and you have some kind of more sensible things that will, yeah, Hey, we're not even going to think about this. This is the way we do it. I think about like on a smaller scale, because I've obviously never worked at a $20 billion company, but the distractions that come up in companies are, are in my mind, that's the thing that these playbooks can help keep you away from the rabbit holes, keep you away from thinking about things that should already be decided upon. But yeah, I would love to, to, to get a crack at seeing what's in there. And I, I wonder how much of it applies to you know companies of all sizes. If you're saying it's like, Hey, this is basic MBA block and tackle. We you know, do certain things a certain way because they're the most optimal. That makes sense. But it's just hard for me to fathom that it applies to everybody, but it sounds like it does. It sounds like they're able to get it to, to work for everybody. So some of the big things are cost cutting, product development, and connecting peers. So cost cutting is basically if someone's, if a company is based in like San Francisco or something, they'll relocate part of the company to a less expensive city like Dallas. And many employees won't make the move. So that'll basically be a way of getting rid of people and then they could hire cheaper replacements. Product development. So often these businesses are made by like some technical person that was really good at solving a problem but they don't, they're definitely not like professionally trained in product development. Hmm. This is something that we've seen as well is just like people are really working, but they're not necessarily working on the right things. Focusing on creating value for like the end customer product development and then connecting peers. So what they do with a lot of their companies, even from the very beginning is getting people that are doing similar jobs together to share best practices. And they do that monthly across most of their companies. Wow. Okay. We've seen examples of that. And, and it seems that is a, an interesting place to play because that does make a ton of sense. We're like, Hey, we're all dealing with the same financial issues, dealing with the same software, issue, you know, whatever it is, pick a part of a company and sharing best practices or sharing experiences is likely helpful. But it's funny. A lot of companies, there's, there, there are drawbacks to that. There are like, you can maybe create a culture where they are complaining about a lot of the same things or, or I shouldn't say complaining, but when you're acquired by somebody, what is that set of constraints that are introduced around cost cutting specifically. It's like, how do we all operate? So they must have value add enough that people can get together. And if that much 
create, because in my mind, there's this idea of putting these companies in a portfolio makes sense. And then, but forcing them to play nice is it, it can be tricky and nuanced, but that's a really interesting part of their, their playbook to create these sort of cross company. Cause what's the incentive for anybody to share across a portfolio? They're not incentivized. They work for company A and company B is a separate entity. And why should I? It's yeah, it's a bit of a mix. So they are incentivized to cross sell, it sounds, and they have a structure in place to incentivize that. If you have similar customers, you could sell this business B's uh, product and make some money by doing so. And then they mm. also have this Vista Consulting Group. So it's basically like an in-house McKinsey. That's uh, a little over a hundred people now, it sounds like, which is roughly equal to the investing side. And that's who runs like the training, testing, and kind of implementing of this playbook. So they mm. dive into a company, make all these changes you know, really quickly. It sounds like right upon buying it, they do it. And then they turn it around and sell custom companies within the first four years, which is much faster than other folks. Interesting. I wonder, I'm just thinking in my head, like you look at Constellation where they do none of this. And it just seems a lot easier to do that. And it seems like just a, the opposite approach from Constellation. Who's getting better returns? And as I understand it, they're, they're roughly the same returns. So it's, you can do all this work. You can put all these things together, but it's pretty hard to understand what is the long-term impact. Yeah. Uh, so which one's more successful is your question. Yeah. Uh, which one's more successful? Uh, they seem to be roughly the same. So Robert Smith has consistently generated 30% rate of return for its investors since inception. So since 2000, Mark Leonard would be something similar, but the scale is very different. So Vista has $77 billion under management now. Wow. And they you know, continue, it's basically like a fundraising game. So if you're like, what do you think Robert's up to day to day? It's probably meeting with like super wealthy LPs and trying to maze raise money for bigger and bigger funds. Mark Leonard has just compounded the money he was initially given. Maybe he is technically a better performer since he's just compounded it and hasn't had to raise outside capital. But I believe Robert F. Smith is significantly wealthier because he's just playing with more chips and buying big companies. It's interesting. And does this have a traditional fund model where he holds these companies for three to four years and then dumps them or is it, does he hold them for a, a long time? Their average hold period is 4.7 years after purchase compared to Blackstone, which is 5.7 years, but they also have a bunch of different separate funds. So they have permanent equity vehicles where they can hold things forever. They are IPing, IPOing some of these big businesses. So then they continue to hold equity if they want. They have a debt fund that finances some of these deals. Like it's just a traditional, almost like Blackstone or KKR where you get mm -hmm. so big you just allocators of capital that are well trusted by big LPs. And so you raise every version of every fund you can just to put more assets under management. Yeah. And it sounds like they even filter all the hires too. You have a, a more traditional style where you're, you're buying these companies, juicing them, selling. And with that, you're trying to optimize for a certain outcome within a certain period of time. But that being said, you're bringing new people. And so with this big consulting apparatus, you have these cost-cutting measures, you have these consultants come in, you have this sort of cross-selling, I shouldn't say cross-selling, but yeah, I mean, it's cross right? You're, you're getting these companies to jive with one another for a period of time until you they find them and acquire. Like what happens to these businesses from a personnel perspective? I was looking at this article and it sounds like the consultants come in, they make improvements and then they screen all new hires or do they do it to existing? Yeah. So they do it to existing folks, which is always contentious, especially with older people. So Vista is known for this. They basically, when they buy a company or for all new recruits, they have a personality and aptitude test, which is like an hour long test that assesses technical and social skills, it gauges analytical and leadership potential. And so the goal here is really to determine which people are suited for which jobs and they have silly things like obviously salespeople are better off being extroverted, software developers are better off being introverted. And so this kind of bypasses where you went to school, your race, your gender, anything like that. It's a great equalizer. And so what they're known for is obviously they don't hire Ivy League folks as often. They often hire really smart people that went to like state schools. And those people are willing to jo do a job for like $75,000 that maybe an Ivy League person would expect twice as much. 
and they call these people high performing entry level work. And the results are pretty impressive. Like 35% of Vista's portfolio company employees are women. And then women run two of the five Vista's funds which is super unusual in private equity, which is very male dominated. Just looking at my course, even I think 3% of the people that have bought it are women. Hmm. And that's, there's no bias there. That's just who's interested in buying it. Or maybe my audience on Twitter or something like that. Interesting. So I, that's actually a, a really, when I, I first was understanding the concept of testing, I was like, oh God, this is, it sounds like big brother put you through math problems or whatever else, but it seems like it's a, a huge value add, right? You're going to, cause your people are your biggest asset, right? Let's just assume that sure it's a software business, but people build it, run it, operate it. And it sounds like that's like where their focus is, is like maximizing the, the people capital, human capital that they have. Yeah. So the negative take on this would be, it's basically an excuse to hire young people and fire old people because young people right out of college are more accustomed to taking tests, more likely to score highly. So you hire them and then people that score low aren't fired, but they're less likely to be promoted. Interesting. It seems like it, it's playing out for them pretty well in the sense of like the, the assets under management is, is super heavy weight here, right? This is, it's gobs and gobs of money. This is, is this the largest software private equity firm? It would be them or Tama Bravo. So that's the real only competition. They're basically the same size. They focus on these high growth software companies and they're the only ones playing in that space. So who's better? It would be debatable. I don't know. Their returns are probably very similar, but they're both doing very well. And in terms of they come in, they buy these companies, they, it sounds like some of the more senior players may exit more junior people get promoted up and that's got to have an effect on culture. And what have folks at Vista portfolio companies said about that culture? Does it, is it, private equity sort of balls to the wall, hard charging culture, or is it a mix? Like what happens when you, you make these changes? So anecdotally, I've heard different things. Some people say almost nothing changes. We were already based in Houston or whatever. They didn't fire anyone. They just started growing remotely and nothing changed. Other people said it was more like slash and burn, save a bunch of costs. And it was significantly less fun. And they're like, go, we're selling this three years. So I guess mm. the answer is, I don't really know. I could say with Vista equities culture is uh, people say it's much like Robert F. Smith. So it's a mixture of formal and informal. So he always wears a three-piece suit. And so all his little minions also wear three-piece suits <laughs> as they show up at like startup offices, which seems like uh, not a great match, but that is what they do. And then they're all super friendly. So they greet each other with hugs, board meetings, start and end with hugs. That was a fun one. And then when they sell a company, Smith gives a CEO an expensive Swiss or German watch, and that's supposed to represent the system they created together. So finding the right people to do the, be the best gear in the machine. That's great. I, I like the hugs. I'm into that. I'm into hugs. We should do hugs at, at all of our meetings. It'd be weird because yes. it's just the two of us, but <laughs> Start um, and end every meeting. <laughs> I like that. It it's a, a, sounds like a warmer side of private equity that might also, I could see that potentially also being a farce, right? It's, you're firing somebody or these are board meetings. So maybe it's less so, you know, what it's like to be at a company, but it, they're hard conversations, hard, you know, decisions that need to be made. And I guess it's like, Hey, that's business and we're still people. So the, the hug is per perhaps a symbol for that. Yeah, I, he definitely looks like a hugger. He's like this big, jolly looking guy. <laughs> if I were to say this guy hugs. This guy hugs, yeah. As you've posted this, have you had any interesting feedback? I know you put it on Twitter and a couple other spots. Like, what's the feedback been? Yeah, so the people like these. They like these operating manuals. I think people get a kick out of them. But the most dramatic stuff with him is so he divorced his wife that he had three kids with and he married a former Playboy Playmate of the Year. In 2015, so Hope Smith, you could Google her and see images. She's very attractive, as you would imagine. And then the other reason he was in the news was because he settled, I think, the largest tax evasion case ever. So he was hiding, I think he had to pay $200 million in penalties. I think some of his LPs had to pay like billions in penalties. Oh, my uh, God. So I... I don't include negative stuff in my manuals. It's not, I'm not trying to emulate tax evasion. Uh, maybe I should though. I don't know. But that was like, so. <laughs> that was the biggest pushback on uh, Twitter and elsewhere that you're not including that he's a big tax evader. 
Wow. Was it obviously at that point it's intentional, right? It's, or is it just, uh, I missed a zero or a decimal point rolling with this big of a, a cash flow? but it sounds like it was something coordinated across his LPs of how they were operating the fund. Yeah. Maybe they were saying like, this is going to be earmarked for charities and they didn't actually give to charities oh. with that money. That would be my guess. Cause I think he bought a bunch of homes with it or something along those lines. The other interesting thing he did was in 2019, he pay, he was giving the graduation speech at Morehouse College, a historically black, that's like the black Harvard. Mm -hmm. And he paid for all 400 students loans. So he Dang. paid them all off. And now he has a weekly Zoom meeting with that class still, which that's is awesome. Uh, yeah. So that was super cool. That was like $34 million of his. And that frees up people to do entrepreneurship and stuff. Oh, absolutely. They don't have these loans hanging over their heads. Absolutely. That's like the, the greatest gift. We won't get into student loan debt, but there's just such a, a major difference between those who have it and those who don't and, and the freedom that you can take in your career. You can't take chances if you've got to cover that nut and rent and everything else. It's just like a ball and chain that you got to drag through your, your 20s or 30s. Right. Some people until they're, I know <laughs> even doctors that still have it in their, in their you know late 40s. Yeah, that's a mess, doctors for sure. So I, now that you know all this stuff about Robert, like, what would you like to take away? What would you like to put into practice with us? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. It, the biggest question is how involved to get, because this is, that's like the thing I've been honing in on is, do you touch these companies? And I'm, we talked a lot about the startup studio and my experience around that. And I'm of the mindset that you don't really set the right people in play and, and kind of the management by abdication. And I think that's my takeaway from learning more about this because the returns are roughly the same. The asset class performs enough on its own as long as you, you don't fuck it up. That's my mindset around this. Don't come in, change a bunch of things and, and put people in a negative. I, I would say the playbook is probably really valuable. I think it's here's the rules. These are parameters in which you don't go down rabbit holes. You, you're not going to reinvent something or be the best in the world at something you're not meant to be best in the world at. For example, the you know, sales commissions. Here's the sales commission. We're going to give this to you. We put thought into this and we're not going to let every company have to go through this. And so those are the value adds in my mind where that are great things in the playbook to have, or even have a playbook. And I'd say that's to me, number one is start developing that. It's like, Hey, how do we do accounting terms or all these things that software companies have to deal with and, you know, either pay lawyers to do or whatever else. I think that's the, the biggest one. How about yeah, I think that's spot on. I think the reality is it's like a lot of work to start an investment firm. And then do you want to start a studio or like consulting firm at the same time? And the answer is no, unless you have a billion dollars allocated to you immediately right. and you have the money to do that. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, I, I would argue that like that's a fee generating thing. Obviously, some of it's going to come from fees from investors and all, all some of it's going to come from portfolio companies. That is a, a sort of a fee generating. It's a Definitely a great way to maximize your profits out of this. But if the rate of return, all things the same, it doesn't necessarily make an impact. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, I, but I don't know. if you compare it, just these scale, two. I think it definitely does because you need all these people to implement stuff on a smaller scale. Like I want this trading of knowledge and I think building out a checklist is something I've already started doing myself. And then you just make it shared across companies. And mm -hmm. it's like a hundred points where you can do in diligence. Is this company optimizing all the things it should be? And it's like, no, they're missing 70 of a hundred things. So you could be pretty confident that you could dramatically improve a business almost from the outside, like before you acquire it. And then you hand over this playbook to the new CEO you hire. And it's, you don't have to do all this stuff, but here's 70 ideas that you probably should do to actually make progress and hit your marks. I think that's right. I think that's right. And that's where I leave it is there's enormous value in that playbook and maybe not necessary to do people implementing it as much. So any kind of final notes or thoughts on Robert? Susan? I guess my one question for you before we wrap up is who's next? Anybody else on the radio? Tomo Bravo was interesting because it's very similar. You have Brent Bishore and permanent equity. That was interesting. I don't know. I already have existing notes on a number of people and it's who is worthwhile to do next. 
I wasn't planning on doing anyone immediately. This I wanted to do just as like an offset of Mark Leonard and Constellation because mm-hmm. the opposite. I don't know. Whoever strikes my fancy, I guess I'll do next, but right. no uh, time pressure to do. Anyone else you think is interesting? I don't know. This is, I've been really, I, I didn't really know about this Robert Smith at all. So I, I'm getting exposed to these folks through you. I'll have to think of somebody out there. It's a, it's a, a private space. It's hard. These aren't people that are, you know, popping up on um, my radar all that often. Yeah. I, most of them are very private. I, I don't know why. I think it, the private equity is changing, like venture capital has changed and Andreessen started that where they have like a big media arm and mm-hmm. get a bunch of press. And we're using to a much smaller extent, like the Andreessen playbook of building in public, getting press, going on podcasts and like getting deal flow that way. But the rest of the private equity folks don't really do that except for Andrew and Tiny, I guess he does, but most other people are pretty quiet. Brent Bishore is doing a similar playbook. They just, they're not targeting tech companies at all. They have really good content on this kind of stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Let's keep it up. I think I'm all about doing one of these again. If you, if you find the right target. Yeah. Hopefully people, if anyone listening, if you have anyone that's super interesting, you think I should dive into hit me up. I'm open to taking requests for sure. Awesome. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.